on this episode of Big Drive Energy, which might be the last episode in studio of Big Drive Energy ever. Not ever. That's not true. Feels like ever. Don't don't get dramatic. Mitchell's moving next week, so you know it's <laughs> sick. Um, if Dude, you're watching I, on the YouTube, I have this massive zit that just is. It's unhideable. Is it gross to say that I I popped it for you? You just did, and it's yeah. I've and never now it's bleeding. I've literally never had like I've had like five zits in my life, and I look like a fucking gremlin. <laughs> Anyways, yeah. All right, Cyclops. Maybe the last episode in studio ever. We're gonna call it that to make it extra sad today um, for Big Drive Mitch. But we'll be back every single week. I'll be here in studio. He'll be in New Jersey. You know, living life, working for pins and aces. And you can get save 15% on Pins and Aces with our promo code BDE. Head on over to pinsandaces.com. They are pre- the presenting sponsor of this podcast. You can save 15% off any order if you use our promo code BDE at checkout. 15% off at pinsandaces.com. Today, we're going to get into the European Ryder Cup picks, some kind of shocking picks, some new... Uh, new blood on the European Ryder Cup team, also some really old blood that shouldn't be there, much like the U.S. team at this point. Uh, we're going to talk about a d- broken driver right before a playoff, pretty insane stuff that happened in the golf world. And there's no PGA Tour, uh, of course, this past weekend or this next weekend. They're smart. They miss uh, the first weekend of college football and the first weekend of the NFL. The Fortinet Championship, Max Homa's um, just little bitch comes up here next weekend, but uh, we're going to recap our favorite moments from the 2022-2023 PGA Tour season. Uh, Talk about three moments each that we really enjoyed, one moment together, and it's not just the PGA Tour season, it's 2022-2023 PGA Tour season in in time, Yeah, but it's really just golf moments, Um, and of course, it's all brought to you by Pins and Aces, like I said, use promo code BDE for 15% off. All right, let's tee it up. What a fun PGA Tour season slash golf season it was. It was. We had, um, you know, cutting room floor, obviously, our guy Wyndham Clark winning a U.S. Open. It just wasn't intense enough for me. Yeah. That's, I think, what left it on the cutting room floor for me. Um, What about for you? Like, what were some moments that you were like, oh, maybe this one comes to mind, but didn't include them in the following three? Yeah, I think John Rahm winning the Masters was up there for me. I It didn't quite move the needle. Um Victor Hovland probably burying that putt at, well, not burying, he really didn't make that many putts, but winning at Jack's place in Ohio to uh, bury our dreams of Denny McCarthy at 100 to 1 odds. Mm. Uh, Still hurts. I feel like that was a big, big point because that gave Victor, now looking back on it, his third win. Um, they haven't announced the PGA Tour Player of the Year yet, have they? I don't think so, no. Okay, yeah. Bigger news, I Yeah, think. that's what I, I thought. But I assume he's going to win player of the year, winning the last two events of the season, three wins total. Uh, so you got to think that him kind of moving in the right direction, winning in Ohio, was a pretty fucking big deal. Um, but, yeah, those are some a few of the moments that kind of really do come to mind. I mean, the majors are always a big deal. Brian Harmon coming out of nowhere uh, to win the Open Championship is a pretty big deal. Uh Short kings everywhere rejoice. Um, He doesn't hit it much further than I do, but he just hits it way better and has a way better fucking short game. So, uh, yeah, it just goes to show you anybody can win a major. And it was a very fun year, man. Like, I really just enjoyed doing this with you and not trying to get sappy and all, but if this is our last podcast in the studio together for a while, uh, let's just enjoy it. Let's live it up. All right, living it up we are. I should have brought some Breckenridge Distillery shots. Um, we should have. Brought those in here. I do have some. I'm sure we can head. find some liquor around I, here somewhere. I have some in my office, but... Um, <laughs> Wonder what that's doing there. Uh, yeah, not getting drank during working hours, <laughs> which are when I choose. Okay. Um, I was going to say, what are working hours for you? Uh, when I want. Okay, you know, that sounds like a pretty sweet... When I sweet, feel like it. That sounds like a pretty sweet gig. It is. All right, uh, let's hop into your first, uh, one of your first favorite, or one of your three favorite moments of the year. Once again, if you guys are not watching us on the YouTube, head on over to our YouTube channel, Big Drive Energy. You get the whole video breakdown of all of, especially this one, you're going to see all the moments. Now we'll, of course, recap it because those of you listening to the audio, we appreciate you as well. But these are some moments from the past season that 
that we just uh, love. And we're taking these from basically videos off of Twitter uh, and recapping them uh, one by one. So, all right, Mitchell, I'll let you lead it off here. You couldn't help but seem to smile and laugh after the birdie putt on 18. What's going through your mind? What elicited that emotion? Well, I think it's the, the group. Okay, so, you know, JT hoops one in there, and then Rory's, you know, been, been beating us all day, and, uh, you know, he's nervous as can be because he didn't want to be the one to, to miss on 18, and I, I didn't want to be the, the idiot host to miss it right in front of everybody after I just went birdie, birdie. You know, these are all things that, go, that we all say amongst each other, um, but obviously people don't hear it, but, you know, Caddy's here, we all hear it, and it was, it was a great round, having a flow of us uh, needling each other, encouraging each other and telling stories because I, I haven't been out here so I had missed uh, some of the things that have transpired on tour which is kind of fun you can all right so that was Tiger Woods after him JT and Rory all made birdie on 18 at Riviera which is a special place but I simply had to do this one because I legitimately remember watching that and just how much fun that that pairing was to watch Come to find out, JT was going to have a fucking horrible year, still on the Ryder Cup team. Uh, a few things to take away from that. Tiger is trying to get down with, like, the new golf lingo. Like, he's like, JT hooped one in there. It's like he either hooped it or, like, slammed one in there. What I, I, don't oh, think, yeah. so he, I don't think hooping it in there is a thing. No, so he, yeah, you can, it's very clear that he was working on the new lingo, but doesn't quite happen. Well, and he's you know? also a little bit behind on the new lingo because the new hoop means your butthole. So that's not that's not what the current hoop means. He that's like ten years ago hoop. Yeah, I mean, if he was talking about actually hooping one, that <laughs> that could mean a few things. Yeah, um, but in yeah, the golf you could world, take that in a lot of different directions. That would have meant he actually like, like slam dunked it out. It. Yeah, yeah like, exactly, and carried it into the hole. So he just made a birdie putt. Yeah, <laughs> he didn't hoop it in there, but you know, good effort on your part, Tiger. Maybe Charlie's teaching him some of these terms, uh, but just the fact of the matter that like we don't know what we're going to see of Tiger, you know, in in coming years. And I'm uh, well known for not being like a massive, massive Tiger fan like everybody else. Like growing up, that wasn't my guy. Uh, but you just have to respect what he's done in his career. Obviously, it's a top two career in all of golf. Uh, not one, but <laughs> top two, not two. <laughs> no, it's top two, number two. But very cool to see him enjoy his time with Rory and JT out there. And Riviera is like a week that I just never miss on the PGA Tour. It's a stop. Like, there's very few sixth major, some call it. Yeah. <laughs> well, what's the fifth? Players. Players. Okay. Uh, yeah. That. But I don't. I don't. I don't even like TPC Sawgrass as much as I like Riviera. Like, there's there's just a few tournaments every year that you have to watch because the golf course is so freaking good um and riviera is one of them year in year out the genesis so uh very cool moment to see tiger walk up 18 make birdie along with jt and rory um did you do you remember watching that or hearing about it uh, i do rem well yeah I, I definitely watched because tiger still um like most golf fans moves the needle for me yeah like it, it does suck to watch him play badly I, that one he at least played all four rounds so yeah, made the cut um, that was solid a solid start for him um yeah. but yeah just a good group and i feel like it's kind of crazy how jt even being quote unquote as young as he is is like you know if you got in with tiger if you told like jt 10 years before he started like becoming friends with tiger that he was going to be friends with tiger woods one day that's like a uh, a whole another classification in itself like on pinch like, me moment yeah like, like i wonder if you told jt like you're gonna be the worst player on tour but you're gonna be friends with tiger woods <laughs> or you're gonna be win like 10 tour events as like a 15 year old you yeah. never know like a lot of the kids our age you're going with like a choice if he could choose between those two yeah that was not the greatest analogy off the yeah, top of my head for sure you're going he'd, with that. he'd probably want to win more tournaments but you just don't expect like usually in in sports, the old guard is friends with the old guard, and then it you know the new guard comes up together, and they're yeah. all friends, and then they move into the old guard, and then you know you don't see a lot of that. But in golf, it's very different. Like Tiger, you know, Tiger's probably close or 
Charlie Woods is probably closer in age to JT than Tiger is. Yeah. Which is his son. And, you know, when you get to a certain point in adulthood, it's like a big plateau. It doesn't plateau. matter, yeah. Yeah. It's I like, have, like, buddies that are 50 years old, and I just don't give a shit. Right, yeah. They, they'll still call us, you know, kid and whatnot, but they're we're on the same level, yeah. relatively speaking. You're all adults. And you realize, like, dudes that are in their 40s are just not as mature as you feel like they are when you're yeah. a kid. That's one of the things that you learn mm -hmm. growing up. Um, you know, it's just not a thing to be mature ever. Well, and then you see what Tiger does off the course and you realize he has no maturity himself either. So that's a <laughs> subject for a different day. But uh, uh, yeah. I thought we were going to talk about how good Tiger Woods was and then you just go and well, go no, there. I mean, he, he, how incredible this moment was. It was incredible, but he, he has some, uh, he likes to, he likes to party off the course. Let's put it that way. Yeah. He likes uh, to mix things. Yeah. <laughs> He, yeah, he likes to mix alcohol and steering wheels, <laughs> apparently. And, and prescription medication. Yeah, that's a threesome you don't want to be a part of. No. Well, <laughs> any, any <laughs> the who, first threesome I've ever heard I don't want to be a part of. <laughs> uh, pretty sure you've been there. But uh, okay, so let's move on to the next one. <laughs> no, you don't have prescription He's wheels. All the way back. Kepka. Brooksy. Okay, so Brooks Kepka winning a PGA Championship this year after everything that has gone down with Liv, um, him in full, full swing, completely looking like he lost his game, may never make it back. Uh, you know, just a giant question mark. And this was truly like the first year, because this was full swing's first season, this is truly the first time you've gotten a behind-the-scenes look of a tour player feel like they've hit rock bottom. You know, like, he's like, I, and I think that's genuinely why he went to live is because he didn't know if he'd ever make it back here. But now he's got five majors in the last seven seasons. So, you know, what are you going to, he, he's on pace to break almost every major record there is. He's in his early 30s. If he plays 15 more years, he could be up there with Tiger, you know, who knows. But I, I think that after choking at the Masters, Turning around and just being so in the zone, unlike on autopilot at the PGA, dominating that uh, was just a huge mover of the needle for the golf world. And one of my upcoming moments, uh, it'll make that even more interesting, but we can discuss that. Well, yeah. And I think, um, like you said, Brooks Kepka blowing it at the Masters because the live PGA, the first major of the year was the Masters, as we all know it, back to a normal schedule, you know, after the whole COVID scenario. Now we're in a new a new schedule of all four majors in four back to back months, which sucks. You, you don't hate at the time, but now it sucks. Like yeah, it's, eight or, months with no majors is ass. Yeah, that is that is accurate. But he if we thought he was gonna win the Masters for a while, Rom, which you kind of touched on as a cutting room floor moment. Still, but double bo four putting and double bogeying the first hole and winning the Masters is one of the most incredible feats a golfer will ever. Like mentally, their fortitude is just in Rom's is off the charts for that. Well, and they say sometimes that like, don't you ever feel a little more freed up when you bogey the first? Like, I don't think it necessarily. I am, no, I immediately panic when I bogey the first hole. Because <laughs> you think you're gonna bogey this next seventeen holes? Exactly. Yeah, I feel like I'm I'm fucking captain you need to of the get bogey those bars train. In while you can, I'm captain of the bogey train. You're like, well, I got the par fives coming up. I can hit those. And yeah, two maybe and three I'll jack them. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> and you're like a swift eighty six coming in hot. Uh, but yeah, yeah keep like, it under 90. That's like my first thought when I bogey the first hole. <laughs> but I think with like a guy like Rom, it just kind of frees him up. He's like, okay, I'm just out here to play golf. Like fucking makes a crazy run. I will still say though, that, uh, the masters felt more like a major that Kepka lost instead of Rom winning, but you know, it's hard to contend with what the Rom, uh, run that the, he made the after. rom comma john yeah the rom comma john run uh he made the last 71 holes so uh but then like i said i think it was more of a big deal for brooks to turn around and win that next major after what he had just dealt with at the masters because that can shatter a player for their career you know like look at rory at the masters he uh what was it 2011 where he pissed down his leg on the back nine and he has never really come that close to winning it again now. So just the fact that 
even though he didn't win at Augusta, Brooks turns around, wins at Oak Hill, one of the tougher major championship venues that hosts a major, uh, major championship venues. Thank you. Uh, it just, I was very impressed. And I think that it, it has to put Brooks back on everybody else's radar going forward. Um, he is one of the best players in the world. World, We will see him at the Ryder Cup, and I think he's one of the most electric players on this U.S. Ryder Cup team. Yeah. Do you think that with... You mentioned Full Swing. What a you know great documentary. If you haven't seen it, watch it. I, I don't know if you're listening to this podcast and haven't seen it. We, I, did, that, an epi- we did a short epi. Yeah, we did an episode of a uh, recap of each short, uh, Full Swing. <laughs> short episode recap of each Full Swing episode. There you go. There you go. But um, do you think... Okay, so you've got the Live Truthers, which I can kind of put us in there, but you've got the staunch Live haters, right? You've got a group of them. Let's say there's 100 of them. How many of those, if all, let's assume we're going to do a math equation here, right? Okay. You lock it in. Yeah. Okay. There's a hundred live haters okay. that just can't stand the live. Yeah. Ryan Koenigsberg, one of them. Yeah. Shout out RK. There's a hundred of those guys. All of them watch full swing. Okay. How many of those guys then actually, you think, transferred over to rooting for Brooks Kepka or being happy for Brooks Kepka winning the PGA championship? I would say like 30 to 40 of them. Yeah, like and that. so that's more than zero, obviously, yeah. a lot more than zero. And I'm kind of on par with you, like almost half or, or close to half of yeah. the, the people that hate Liv watched what he went through in that documentary during the middle of the season. Like w- the Liv documentary or the documentary was not produced necessarily always during Liv. Like they, there's some cuts that are here and there. Yeah, they got you know, it right they, at the right Mito time. Pereira, they had him, he had no clue he was going to live, all that, all that stuff. But... I think nobody else has any clue where he, if he's at live right now. Either. No, he's, and he doesn't. Know he still where hasn't he is. done shit. <laughs> yeah, but he, the Brooks Kepka episode was just so like endearing for the normal everyday golfer to realize like no matter whether you normally shoot a hundred and you've been shooting one hundred and twenty or you normally you know are a professional PGA Tour professional winning major after major, I can't and make you can't, a five footer. <laughs> yeah, so it, it's standing on the putting green, just like missing five footers, and he's just like fucking losing his mind with every putt he makes. Yeah, so it made him super relatable, and I think, like you said, and I'm on on board with you. There was a lot of people that were like, "That's pretty cool." Yeah, that he ended up winning the tournament. They're not like just basically putting him in that live bundle and just get like being uh, totally drawn away from it. I will say though, and I don't know if you agree with me, I would say Kepka is probably almost the most polarizing player in the game right now because I can't really think of a dude that's hated and loved simultaneously by groups of people like he is. Do you know what I'm saying? Like yeah, well, there's a group of people that thinks he's a total arrogant douchebag thinks he's way better than everybody like he's just an athlete he doesn't care about golf he doesn't respect golf this and that and then there's like i feel like a big group of like kids our age kids like 20 somethings late 20s early 30s that like look at this dude now that they've gotten into golf as former athletes and they're like holy shit like this guy is an athlete that chose to play golf and i almost feel like dustin johnson was that guy before brooks kepka was that guy but dj was just never as outspoken as brooks and it really hasn't had the the major success i mean he, he won the us open and has dj won a second one do you remember a second major yeah i think I, he's got two okay you know, he won the masters Oh, he did, won the November Masters. Oh, he won the yeah the COVID the Masters. Masters. That yeah. doesn't count because neither does the Lakers uh, championship that year. So can't count that one. But I, I just feel like Brooks is the most liked and hated simultaneously by different groups than anybody in golf. And I think that's what golf needs. Like almost everybody likes Scotty Scheffler. I would say there's a group of people that don't like John Rahm because of his fiery attitude. Um, but then Rory, you know, most people like Rory, most people like Ricky, most people like there, there's not a lot of guys that are willing to play that villain role in golf anymore. And Brooks just like completely embraces it. And it's actually funny. I think it's a little bit douchey, but also hilarious that when his wife like posts afterwards, like, oh, just dusting off the trophy case, like they they fully embrace like the role that Brooks is and he doesn't give a shit if anybody likes him or not. Yeah, what's funny is he was the villain in like 90% of his role as a PGA Tour player a lot of his career. Obviously going to live extended that, but in the whole Brooks versus Bryson, he was the other way. Like there was like probably 5% of the people that were like 
on Bryson's side, and then yeah. he, you know he turned into the. Well, that's one way to make yourself look good is just hang out with the biggest douchebag in the entire world, the the biggest ass hat on any <laughs> tour that there is. And actually, I I don't hate Bryson as much as I used to, uh, but he's still like I said, it's like you know I hate to say it, but being a decent looking dude, it depends on who you hang out with that either makes you better looking. Or not as good looking. You know what I'm oh, saying? Let's just talk about the ch- it's chicks. <laughs> it, it, there's yeah, always like chicks. a good five or six that hangs out with a lot of twos. Yeah. And she looks like a 10. Yeah, exactly. And so Bryson hanging out with Brooks is making Brooks look like a 10. I mean, he's still like a hard nine. He's all the way around. I, li- I like the guy. But Bryson. Do you need a minute? Bri- <laughs> no, I, I'm good. Uh, my I got my short shorts on. That wouldn't work. Um, or actually, it might, but. <laughs> Uh, Bryson hanging out with Brooks is just, they're not really like hanging out now, but it's kind of a full circle, bury the hatchet thing. And Brooks is like, well, if everybody hates Bryson, then they got to like me or at least take the, the, what is that old saying? The, the enemy of my enemy is my friend kind of thing. Okay. Uh, I don't necessarily know who the enemy of the enemy is there, but I just thought it was a good quote in my head. No, I dig it. Okay. Perfect. All right, do we want to get to your third one? Third favorite moment? Yeah. <laughs> Bang. Bra- Bra- just a tweet. This was quite the day in general. Yeah, breaking. This was on June 6th. Breaking. The PGA Tour has agreed to merge with Saudi back to live golf. This will end all pending litigation, and the two leagues will combine their commercial businesses into a new yet-to-be-named company. The deal will be announced today. So that was that probably was- the wildest day that golf has had other than when Liv was announced um, in the last, you know, this century. Probably since Tiger won the Masters in, like, fifth, what was that, 15 or in yeah. 19? Yeah. One of, that's but two separate years. That is the thing with golf is it's nobody's ever known it as, like, in the NBA you have off-the-court drama. You've got, you know, contracts, all this shit. Uh, NFL, same thing. Uh, MLB, all of this. There's always off-the-field off the drama that keeps people sucked in and the PGA tour does not have any of that. So maybe that's kind of what the PIP was trying to do, you know, keep people engaged, keep people talking golf, but I guarantee you more people talked golf. Like this was announced by CNBC originally. It was first reported by CNBC, a major news outlet, um, not even the golf channel or anything. So the fact that it was put out on national news and I, I know for a fact that, Anybody that even doesn't really give a shit about golf heard that. And it truly, I think we don't even, we haven't even scratched the surface of how much it's going to change the professional golf uh, landscape. And I really do hope that the live guys are able to play in some PGA Tour events. And ultimately, we get all the best players on the same course again, because that's what golf is going to be best for. Um, And it was just a massive, massive day. We did a live pod that day too, because that was just probably the biggest announcement, like we said, since you know, since Liv was announced. But other than that, it's like nothing moves the needle quite like the the Liv and PJ Tour beef now that's gonna be quote unquote put to rest. But I think it it's firing up both fan bases even more against one another. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, it just adds to the um the overall product of golf. Like, that's the biggest key here. That's what we're all looking for. The is real to, winners here are us. Exactly. The fans of golf that love to watch it, love to talk about it. Um, the losers, sounds like everybody on the PGA Tour that did not cut a deal with Liv because uh, Jay Monahan just turned around and sold the farm basically because they were going to get put under by Liv with legal fees. So, uh, you know, I, I'm i not a huge – I don't hate Liv. I, I – don't love it either. It's I don't turn on the CW and watch that shit. The one we went to in Tulsa was a good time, and I don't, uh, you know, I'm not a PJ Tour fanatic truther. Like I just want to watch good golf. I don't care where it's being played. Uh, but the fact that uh, they they were able to basically manipulate the PJ Tour into now the 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 PIF basically owning the PJ Tour and and all of its funding coming from there. Like, you know, you can't turn down billions of dollars that they're going to invest into golf. So I think ultimately the golf product is going to be much better for it. A lot of it still remains to be seen. 
Uh, but a monumental day in golf that will be talked about for years and years to come because even you and I, when you know, when the Live Tour started, we were like, this is going to be cool, but it seems like taking a good product and just splitting it down the middle and making two fairly good products. And now if we can just combine those two back together somehow with more money, less commercials, which Jay Monahan, uh, credit to him, he's trying to sell the general public on this merger. He said there's going to be less commercial time, which, holy shit, maybe they can cut it down to a half hour of every hour of coverage. But, uh, yeah, it's going to be freaking insane to see where this shit goes. Yeah, it's it's a ever-moving needle on the in the entire world of golf, which makes it so fun because we never know what's going to happen next. Like, they announced the PGA Tour 2024 schedule, but in – in two years, is that going to be our our live players even next year going to be able to play if this moves along in, in certain events or, you know, take spots in certain events or however that's going to work. But overall, yeah, that was the moment that we couldn't leave on the cutting room floor. And I, I obviously had it in my holster, but I saw you, you took it. So, um, no, definitely maybe, like you said, the biggest moment in as long as we can remember. In the the game biggest golf. non-golf golf moment since maybe his since tiger woods crashed his car probably yeah. <laughs> ironically you know yeah like that's completely really it and i would say it was bigger than that i mean oh absolutely this involves but. yeah no i i agree it we rarely get stuff off the golf course about golf so this was the biggest announcement we've had in years and years so i i had to put it on there oh yeah all right well we're gonna get into my three moments but first want to tell you guys about bet 365 we are resetting our units here uh, the PGA Tour season is over, so we're going to reset our units going into the Fortinet Championship. Maybe change the way we do a few little things going forward. I'm just going to bet Max Homa. <laughs> you, if Fortinet. you don't, if we don't have him on the card and he wins, we're the biggest idiots alive. We still may be the biggest idiots alive, but correct golf betting wise, we're double the idiots that we could be. <laughs> um, bet three six five pioneered live in game betting. They offer the widest range of games and markets available for live in game betting. They have 80 million users worldwide and stream over 780,000 events a year. So once again, if you're on Bet365, you can't find the show or the the show. Uh, welcome to the fucking show. You can't find the game or event that you're trying to watch. You can live bet on it and it can put, it right, put it there right on your phone during the event. Um, they have great profit boosts. Uh, make sure to read those. Mitchell got duped by a profit boost in the... Uh, tour championship, but it's a couple weeks out. I think that that sting has worn off a little bit. A little bit. That $550 um, would still be nice. But you, know. <laughs> but you can turn $1 into $200 of bonus bets when you join Bet365. Download the app, deposit $10, and claim $200 in bonus bets as soon as you place a bet for a dollar. We still have some bonus bets. I want to say about half of our bonus bets um, for the 2023 season to still use, so we'll probably... Uh, use those to the best of our ability to maybe make some make some money back on the PGA Tour. But I've I we would kind of talk towards the end of the year. Our units started dwindling. We were in the negative. I think we finished like negative ten or fifteen units, which isn't terrible for a whole year of putting twelve units a week on golf. But the uh, we we kind of like we it wears on you. Like oh, yeah. it sounds so sad because it it's gambling, down. but it it wears on you. And then like you. We put out the picks and we're wrong and we're wrong again. And these guys it's like are when like, a stone, like just a single drop of water hits a stone, just over time it leaves a dent. Yeah. Like that was just us with betting just, golf. <laughs> the PGA Tour weeks just boom, boom, yeah. boom, just just hitting us right slowly in the mouth. wearing us down. <laughs> yes, um, but no. Uh, use the code DNVR three six five when you sign up at Bet three six five. Must be twenty one and physically located in Colorado. Please gamble responsibly. If you or someone you know has a gambling problem. Please call or text 1 800 Gambler. I also want to tell you guys about Broken Tea Golf Club, one of our favorite spots. Um, we're back in the pro shop, back recording TikToks. We recorded a couple the other day. Um, you can use code DNVR10 when you book your tea times and save 10% off. So, Broken Tea is already super affordable golf course, great spot. We had a tournament there early in the year. They have the best, most awesome pro shop staff. Like, I couldn't imagine when we used to do our pro shop videos, like we would ha be alone or it'd be a tournament day and we'd knock one out and it would be, you know, super easy and nobody around. And there was, their staff was in there and they were cool with us and watching and, and it actually was a lot. Yeah. Laughing at our stupid jokes. Um, it only has 85,000 views on TikTok, No big deal. But <laughs> 
yeah, we're back in the pro shop with Broken Tea. So make sure to check them out, uh, brokenteagolf.com. You can book your tea times. Use that promo code DNVR10, and you're going to save $10 off your regulation round. So they've got 18 regulation holes. They've got a par three if you want to work on the wedges. Massive putting green, great driving range, great teachers with Meta Golf if you want to get some lessons. So make sure to check out Broken Tea Golf Club. Great food, too. Great food at Wyatt's. Yeah, that place is fire. All right, now we're going to hop into my three moments, uh, three favorite moments of the year. There was a lot to choose from. I whittled it down to Uno Dos Trace. Uh, my first moment here is going to be, of course, our big Leaf win flag. of the year Nick Taylor from 72 feet for Eagle. And Are you serious? Bang. Oh, my goodness. The first Glorious Canadian winner free. of the Canadian Open since 1954. Longest putt of his career, 72-footer for Eagle on the playoff hole. We watched that whole playoff. The best part is, if you watch it on YouTube, is right about here. Wait for the wait for the uh, champagne. Oh, it's coming because then you see the security guard. I made sure to get one where the security guard. Okay, kinda, I was gonna say that's kay. gotta be included, right? Oh, I think we. Oh, there it is. Yep. Security Storm guard right around, he tackles out. Adam Hadwin we'll to get, the ground. Look we'll at Nick Taylor's. Like, oh, Nick Taylor doesn't give a shit. Of course, the great call from Jim His Nance. Friend, security guard. Dude, look security at that. Did, not, uh, that it was atmosphere exactly is was. unbelievable. Like Canada phenomenal moment. Uh, not only does do we get a win from a Canadian in the Canadian Open, um, but we get. Adam Hadwin tackled to the ground. Two of the greatest moments built into one one minute and 18 second Twitter video here. Well, Hadwin back with the champagne. Um, the crazy thing was, too, is this is the week uh, that the live PGA merger was announced. And everybody's like, who's going to give a shit about the Canadian Open now? And then that finish was probably the best finish of the entire year. Uh, between obviously what happened on the green afterwards and him making that 70 footer in the playoff. I watched that entire playoffs was with Tommy Fleetwood. Tommy uh, couldn't get it done again. No, <laughs> shocker. Still hasn't won on the PJ tour on the Ryder cup team though. Uh, but yeah, that was, I, I remember I actually jumped out of my seat when I watched that live. Yeah. I was vocally loud. Um, because <laughs> I, yeah, that one of 70, that was our like carried us through half the year, basically. Otherwise we would have to give this up. Yeah. Otherwise we would literally fade us. Like you would be we wanting would to be, fade us in the golf world, well, but you probably should anyways, but we would be down like 90, 80, 90. Yeah. It would, it, the, when the units get lower and lower, I just make this font smaller and smaller <laughs> and uh, gradient fill it in to like what the color of the background is more and more, but no, Nick Taylor winning, um, was just so fun for the, the, I almost said the state of Canada, <laughs> the country of Canada to get somebody to win since 19, first time since 1954. And that whole playoff, honestly, he, I thought he was going to lose every single hole. Yeah. And then finally, Tommy, Tommy had, made it, had multiple chances, didn't put it away, didn't make the putts. And then at the end, Tommy finally made a mistake and Nick was just steady Eddie. And then drilling that, like, the Brooks Kepka moment was cool, but he tapped in. Yeah. The, the making a putt to win a tournament is just there's there's and, nothing and more electric than that. It was seventy feet long. Like I think that was the longest putt to win a tournament maybe in PGA Tour history, um, if I'm not mistaken. It's got to be you know right up there if it's not the longest. Uh, but what a freaking week, dude! That was so much fun to watch. Yeah, and you can see you know one of the other things is other tournaments are adopting a party like hole. They had the hockey hole where you could hear the guys hitting the boards when you hit. And, and they sang Oh Canada before every Canadian teed off, which was pretty cool. Um, but then you got Brian Erlacher just laying out fucking Adam Hadwin, take, leveling him, taking him off of his feet. And Adam Hadwin probably weighs 130 pounds, honestly. Like, not, not, a, not a, he's a very slender guy. Um, if that security guard would have hit me, I think things would have gone a little differently for him. Um, probably hurt his shoulder. But he fucking just took Adwin right off his feet. And everybody was so in the moment about him making the butt that they didn't even realize that happened. And so it was just like a nice little extra sprinkle at the end. Like, oh, look what happened mm -hmm. afterwards. And I'm like, holy shit, that really... And in true Canadian fashion, I'm sure Adam Hadwin apologized to the security guard for him not knowing who the fuck he was. Yeah, well, it's another one of those tournaments where, well, first of all, the security guard playing main character was funny. But the... <laughs> 
where you have a, a group of players out cheering for, and it was both ways in that tournament because Fleetwood was there, and they you had like some other English dudes out there cheering for him. Yeah, they each had their like stable of buddies next to the green cheering them on. Exactly, it's more it's like that Ryder Cup feel. Um, which Canada we're versus get, yeah, we're getting in a couple weeks, which I can't wait for. But that you had that feel of like both teams had their team, both players had their teams that were ready to celebrate for them. Mm-hmm. Um, just a great overall moment. All right, moving on to my second one. This one is a little bit in the heartstrings just because of how much this dude means to golf. Like him, so Ricky Fowler, Rocket Mortgage Classic, his first tournament win since the Waste Management in 2019. Once again, clarified it with a putt to win the event. And Ricky Fowler is more than just a, you know, he's got the story. Everybody loves him. He was one of golf's phenoms, but you can kind of see him just, like, taking it and in I mean, his look, caddies, look like, dry humping him. At the, at the, <laughs> look at that crowd at the Rocket Mortgage Classic that nobody really, like, quote-unquote gives a shit about. Uh, but that just goes to show you how beloved Ricky is and such a cool moment for him. Like, he's back on the Ryder Cup team. He's more of a, a glue guy than anything, but uh, very, very cool to, to watch him. Is that Hadwin that he played in the playoff? Who's got the mullet? No, I don't think it was Hadwin. Um, but once again, banging in a putt to win a tournament like that, or else you're going another playoff hole. And Ricky Fowler is probably the most likable guy on tour. And the, and the kids that grew up our age, you know, when he had the orange pants, like how many kids... Puma probably made billions off of an orange hat. Yeah. Like oh, yeah. there's so I've seen so many seven to ten year old kids with an orange flat billed hat, and that's mm-hmm. strictly because of Ricky Fowler. There's and he was maybe still... the first PGA tour player to wear the flat billed hat. I think he was with the uh the hair flipping out of it, like it was twenty eleven all over again. Um I definitely kind of rocked. Oh, his... there's some photos of you with that. Yeah, where, where I'm like flipping my hair back like the biggest tool in the world. Uh, but that's no surprise. Yeah, everybody tried to be Ricky Fowler like when we were teenagers. Every player, like everyone wanted to wear the flat build hat. Like you said, everybody wanted to rock the orange. You had kids, you know, with red and blue uh, colors in high school or in orange shoes and shit. Like he just, he moved the needle like crazy and he's never given us a reason really to not like him. Um I mean, last year at the Rocket Mortgage, he was hitting balls on Saturday morning, and I thought that was probably the douchiest moment he's ever had because he's sponsored by Rocket Mortgage. So they had him getting airtime Saturday morning after he had just missed the cut, and he was literally out hitting balls Saturday morning afterwards. So I was like, I'm kind of like a little bit annoyed by that, that you're, you know, you don't need any more cameras on you and you just missed the cut. But overall, great comeback story for him. Uh like you said, there's just nothing to not like about the guy. Yeah, and he was another player that I think there was at least two or three that I can count off the top of my head of players that won events this year that you thought may never win an event again. And he was firmly in that category. We talked about totally. it on a, on the podcast probably earlier this year Yeah, um, before he won the Rocket Mortgage. Like He got close at, I believe, was the U.S. Open right before the Rocket Mortgage, and he was, like, close but then couldn't finish. And then... it, was, it was pretty close. We talked about it after the U.S. because the U.S. Open's in, what, June, and I think the Rocket's in July. I could be wrong. May, may, I think it, there, it was, like, within a month. So Yeah, and we didn't think Ricky Fowler could ever get it done again, and there he goes winning. You know, the Rocket Mortgage isn't, you know, an the players. Yeah, it's not an opposite field event. Well, I meant players. it is an opposite field. <laughs> no, I mean, it was pretty stacked. Like, it was – there was eh. – some decent players in there. Um, but How many no, guys are going up to play in Detroit? Not that many. Not guys that don't need to, let's put it that way. No, but Rocket Mortgage probably has, like, the most PGA Tour players of any sponsor other than, like, a Titleist, like a ball. That's They you probably, know, like they have a they lot probably of sponsor them there. just so they feel obligated to come play in their event. No, that's, maybe that's a thing. They're like, kind of buying their appearances, yeah. quote-unquote. I mean, well, we saw that. You saw that crowd. Um, I mean, incredible crowd for a Rocket Mortgage Classic. Incredible win by, win by the Rickster. Win by the Rickster. Win by the Rickster. Um, all right, let's get to my last favorite moment of the season, and this is just outstanding content. What's up? Bryson and Phil. So, oh, I'm going to play. What are we playing for? What are we playing for? I haven't thought about that. You what do you mean you haven't thought about it? Well, 
You've been what, what were you thinking about? <laughs> okay, well, Cameron and I will play you guys. You and okay. uh, Honor Bond will play you nine holes for a G. Perfect. Uh, straight best ball. Perfect. Uh, and when you're down, when you're closed out, you can press for half. Not the full? Not the full. Okay. So you got to win the match to win. Yeah, and if you want, what we'll do is we'll go 28. If you shoot 28 best ball, uh, it's double. Perfect. I love that. Okay. That sounds or good. Better, 28 sure or better. He's, he's played a lot more of these addiction. sorts of things, so he, he, knows, he knows how to make a deal that works in his favor. You know, we I actually max it at that. I don't ever play for more because okay. I sit, you know, always want to keep it friendly. Now. That's right. Just so you know, Camo and I, we don't do Venmo, PayPal, any of that bullshit. Like <laughs> straight cash. cash. Yeah, there you go. Okay. Just so right. we're clear. Is there a First America bank around here? So no, okay. <laughs> so Okay, let's break this down for a second. All right, so first of all... Uh, I fucking love that that's clip. That's the greatest clip of all time. Uh, what are you thinking about if when he's not thinking about gambling? Yeah. He's so Phil Mickelson, and all this coming out about Phil just makes this even better. A um, couple quotes in there. I don't ever play for more than that. It's Why? Is it because it too much is tied up in his FanDuel account? Uh, that he <laughs> he's doesn't, got so many bets pending on the fucking Saturday college football. Probably game. on the Ryder Cup, actually. Yeah, no shit. Uh, yeah, the guy. I guarantee. I know he's played for more. He now. I'm sure he plays for a G. Well, and it's also that old saying. Like, I I told you about the dude, and I think I've said it on the pod. But I played mini tour in a an event with this guy who played money games with Tony Romo, and he got to the point where the money was like 150, 200 grand a hole, and a lot of people can't afford that. But at the same time, like, do you think that even moves the needle for Tony Romo? Like, what would Phil really have to bet? For him to be like sweating it, it'd probably have to be right I mean, in that range. Had, what, probably be two hundred. What did he have? Two, Fifteen million dollars gambled in a year. Like I think even if he bets a million dollars on a match, he's really not even sweating it that bad. Like, <laughs> but just an all time like make Bryson look like an absolute square. And Phil, what are you even thinking about? Yeah. Well, and and Phil, so you could almost tell it felt a little staged to me. But also, that is who Phil is. He's just a, a gambling fanatic. Um, I won't use the a word. Uh, he, I think he's. If you're having a game, if you have a gambling addiction, please call one eight hundred Gambler. Yes. Call or text. Yeah. Uh, I think Phil needed. People that. are live to speak with you now. <laughs> I think Phil needed that number at some point in his career, and who knows, he's still. I don't know. If he's still got to gamble on sports. You don't just quit cold turkey, dude. No, I'm sorry. No, we maybe, know we've been maybe, in this. Li- we've been in this world a long time. Maybe he has a deal with his wife where once they get his net worth over like a billion dollars or something, like what are you gonna do with that? You know, you can pay for your grandkids, 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 grandkids college tuition. Yeah, or you um, can just tease Clemson money line in the <laughs> under. You know, like what's more exciting than that? Yeah, exactly. I mean, there's what's going to give you more instant satisfaction than uh, you know, betting Russian table tennis at 3 in the morning. Yeah, and uh he makes a good point here too which uh can take us down two roads. One, how much money so uh we have a good friend AC that uh plays out at the golf course and he like his bag is like a, uh, it's like a bank. Like he never p- takes money out of it, but he never puts money into it. Yeah. Or he probably maybe started with a little bit in there, but it's literally just his golf gambling money. Yeah. So he never uses it. But you got to think PGA Tour players like on a what, Tuesday Wednesday practice round, what 10, 15 G's in their bags. Yeah. The, the bigger the, the guys, higher yeah. level. Yeah. The rich. Some dudes. other dudes are. Paying for their dinner with the last couple, you know, last 20s in their, yeah. some of the guys playing in those events. Well, that is kind of the sad thing about, like, the new school tour, I would say, is I bet, like, guys like Colin Morikawa are like, nah, dude, I just want to, like, hit practice putts and really get Oh, a shot yeah. at Morikawa. I, dude, I just... I, yeah, I, maybe, I, maybe he's addicted, dude. I, no. I can't say that, but you know what I was going to say. I mean, addicted to gambling? Yeah. What, what are you going to say? I mean, you can't really say it, but oh, okay, well, Colin let's... Morikawa, gambling, <laughs> those two add up. Yeah, those check out. He could be a gambler, but he just strikes me as too much of a square to, to worry about gambling. Um, and I feel like a lot of the new school guys, like I could see Brooks being like, what are we playing for, 10 Gs? Um, yeah. Uh, <laughs> you know, there's certain guys where I feel like back in the day, every like Woody Austin I know would like, this was 30 years ago, he would drive to not even on location of a PJ tour event to play like Monday money games with dudes when he was full-time on tour. Like that's just how much he loved to gamble and golf. 
And I really don't feel like these guys anymore. And even at these mini tour events, I hear guys all the time that are boys. They'll be like, yo, we got, they're betting more on the round between each other than they're going to make in the purse. Like that's how some of these mini tour guys make money is they bet the friends that they know. And even some guys they don't, they'll throw a game and be like, Hey, you guys want to 500 bucks a guy? Low man takes the pot. Like the <laughs> golf is naturally just a gambler's dream. It, yeah, um, I don't think we've ever like set up a round of golf with two other people and gone there and not discussed a term of a bet on the first tee and just yeah. been like, yeah, let's just go hit it around. Like that's never happened. Unless it's our family. Yeah, I mean, I'm not going to hustle mom for a quick 20 <laughs> because she can't putt. You know, that's fucked up. She actually, the only thing she can do while yeah, is putt. Actually, yeah, she's uh, sculling wedges, but she can she can roll the rock. Yeah, old, she she can roll the rock. Our mom she, can roll it. It's the <laughs> one of the worst putting strokes you've ever seen in your life, but it the looks fucking like ball goes in the hole. Will's Alatoris if he had his eyes closed uh, and he was left-handed. Yeah, it's, uh, it's yeah. rough. But she gets it in the hole. She gets it done. Uh, but yeah, the... It is so hard the more you get into golf to, especially you're playing your buddies. Um, I've gotten trapped into a few games where it's like me against the two of them or me, you know, I get the the worst of the the other three in the middle two pair up. Uh, but either way, it's like, how, how do these dudes playing as much golf as they play when they're not actually playing for money on the weekend? How are they not betting every round? Like I would be, oh, I would need that gambling hotline if I was on the PGA Tour. Oh, yeah. That's a lot of money being thrown around. And the last thing, interesting comment. Well, first of all, the PayPal Venmo thing, hilarious, because the world we live in nowadays, no one carries feels cash. So old and school. I love that. Yeah. You, you just feel the handing someone one dollar feels better than getting Venmo 10. He, he, oh, yeah, absolutely. He feels like the dude that just like rolls up somewhere and hands everybody a hundred dollar bill. Yeah. Like the valet guy, the, the concierge. He just takes care of everyone because he just, he seems like he's that kind of cool dude like that. Yeah, and the the comment that just shows where how different of a world PGA Tour players live in, if we best ball 28, it doubles. <laughs> That's fucking absurd to even consider somebody like shooting like th that's in their realm yeah like oh, yeah. most people it's like if if we best ball if we it, best ball at 28 that's probably like us peaking yeah if we best ball i mean i mean we, i shot like 30 or 31 by myself i'm but. not saying we i'm saying like the general public and the people that watch that they'd be happy to best ball 36 with one of their buddies oh even absolutely par. yeah 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 i mean it's definitely like uh and we're talking a birdie a hole here except for one maybe one par yeah, and was that actually at the Greenbrier? Where I, I believe so. Okay, where I mean, are we, do we? Oh yeah, that's that uh, cycles us into this last moment um, that we decided together on. We just couldn't leave this one out of there. It's non PGA Tour related, but we're gonna get two into one, and that's uh, Bryson DeChambeau, fifty eight and a win, first round under sixty in live golf history, makes a forty footer to do it. It's close. All these calls are great, too. I mean, come on. 58. The Greenbrier has played host to a weekend of Well, yeah, and he shot 61 the day before that. So probably the best two days of golf in the entire golf world. Um, at least in men's golf, that's televised that I know about. But what a... Yeah, oh, cool. Yeah, I love the enthusiasm. An emphatic champion at the Greenbrier. 21 under par over the weekend. And that is disgusting. It is. And the thing is, is that's not a Mickey Mouse. That's a real golf course. That's it's par a, 70, but par yeah, other than that, it's, it's... I mean, they used to play it on tour for years. Right. It's a fifth... It, the fact that he made a long putt, kind of that Nick Taylor-esque, for a 58, like he... If I was in that realm, you know, they've probably shot 59 multiple times on whatever courses they play on off weeks. So it's probably not as intense for them. But to do that in a tournament and know you could snuggle one up there for 58 or 59 and just, and just bang, bang it, it in for 58 with the flag in kind of lame. Stones. But that was a, a great moment overall. Well, and he, he may have not been able to see the bottom of the fucking hole. He was 40 feet away. That's probably true. Right over a massive ridge. Um all right, let's get into the European Ryder Cup picks. But before we do that, we want to tell you guys about 
Burrito Express, of course, Burrito Express is always supporting local businesses, and they are a local business, so you want to support them. Down in Arizona, they have six locations. The Tempe location is my favorite. I think I'm headed down to Tempe in about a month, actually, for a Coach Prime uh, CSU or CU. Whoa, that's people are going to hate me for that. Coach Prime CU football game down at Arizona State, and I'm definitely going to have multiple Burrito Expresses, probably both mornings, even maybe a late night one if I go out to the bars. Uh, I love the steak burrito. The uh, breakfast burritos are the best. They put potatoes in them like you always should, but some people don't. Um, we're always going to have them at our tournaments. They're an incredible s- supporter of us here at All City, Be, uh, Big Drive Energy, and they have the best burritos in Arizona. And like I said, six locations, so you can find it anywhere. Check them out. Um, also check them out on Twitter at Burrito Express. They support Arizona State Athletics and Athletes. Um, just a great company in general, and I messed that up. Grab a burrito and follow them on Twitter at Burrito EXP, not Burrito Express. Burrito EXP on Twitter. Uh, and we always wash our burritos down with some Breckenridge Distillery. Of course, we've got the Battle of the Bourbon in the Denver Broncos contest this year. We've got Ed McCaffrey versus Alfred Williams. You can vote on Breckenridge Distillery to win Broncos swag. Also, you can win two tickets to the Whiskey Suite for the December 31st game against the Chargers, New Year's Eve game in the Breckenridge Whiskey Suite. Nothing better than that. They also have a new vodka commemorating the first white alternate Broncos helmet, which I'm so stoked to see. They are the official bourbon of the Denver Broncos, and the bl- it's called the Broncos Blizzard. That's the new vodka. Definitely going to try that. The Ricky Seltzers are all made with Breck spirits. Of course, we know Breckenridge Distillery is the world's highest distillery. Founded in 2008, they're widely known for their blended bourbon whiskey, high rye mash American-style whiskey. Their Breck bourbon is one of the most highly awarded craft bourbons in the entire United States. And you can find it in all 50 states. Even though it's crafted here in Colorado at the beautiful Breck, which if you haven't gotten a chance and you're here in the state, go to the distillery. It's incredible. But you can visit BreckenridgeDistillery.com for home delivery of award-winning Breckenridge spirits. All right. European Ryder Cup team announced is, I'm guessing, since the Ryder Cup is in Rome at uh, oh uh, Simone, Marco Simone, Marco Simone Golf Club. I wonder if Andre Simone is re- any relation there. He's from <laughs> Italy. Um, but I'm sure Simone is a s- relatively common pr- name. Probably. But do you, is, so does the European team get to pick second because the U.S., like they are hosting it? That's like a you would question. think that would be like a like a Almost style like a, a where you're like sitting like together and you're like to oh, boom boom boom. But I think these guys know who they're picking no matter what. Well, yeah, I mean, I I don't know about that because I don't know if Ludwig Ludwig Aberg makes it on the team after uh, you know he just won last weekend. So yeah, he won the European Masters last weekend. Uh, another win on the DP World Tour, and Ludwig Aberg becomes the first golfer in history to play in the Ryder Cup without playing in a major. Yes, it's insane. And like, I don't know how he didn't qualify for a major being like the number one college golfer in the US. Like Yeah, the, you've got these like random amateurs playing in majors and yeah. you can't get Ludwig Aberg. We definitely bet on him a few times. He's a weekend choke. So I will remember that when the Ryder Cup rolls but around. But dude, he's twenty two. I think Choking. but I, I don't disagree with you because this is going to be by far the biggest stage he's ever played on. Um, and even they they posted the video of Luke Donald calling him, and he was like, well, you know, you've played on big stages. I'm not sure if you've played on one this big yet. So it's going to be a, a crazy thing for him, not to mention Nikolai Hoygaard, who has actually won more on the DP World Tour and contended on the PGA Tour also, but I think he's like 23 years old, a, 20, like very, very young. A very low-key name that we know, you know especially, yes. but a lot of people look at that and are like, are going to be like, all right, Automatic L. They should have uh, dra- for them. They should have picked up Rasmus, his twin brother, and they imagine twin brothers on a Ryder Cup team. How sick would that shit be? Yeah, I don't think that's ever been done before. Um, so the biggest, so a uh, Ludwig Aberg, that was his first, um, his first professional win was literally right before he was picked. Like that's insane. Can you imagine being picked for the Ryder Cup team in your country or your? essentially the world-ish outside yeah, of, the, yeah. you know, uh, a great area, continent area without winning a tournament. So yeah. he picked up a win, um, and the biggest um, snub snub 
is Adrian Moronk. Um, this dude hits it so fucking long. Like, he legitimately, his ball speed averages probably 195, and he can uncork it well over 200. So I am surprised. Like, he won this year at Marco Simone Golf Club. Uh, oh, that's so disrespectful. Yeah. Uh, I guess <laughs> on the, um, this is from a Forbes article, um, this past week on Sky Sports, which is the year, like carries most of the European tour, Mark Rowe, uh, Morong finished tie 13th and he said, quote, it would be one of the crimes of the century if he doesn't make it. Wow. And there is a little bit of like that inner, like Luke Donald played with Ludwig Aberg this year and was, so he got an up close look at him. Yeah. I mean, the um, guy's elite, but he's not elite yet. Like, right. There's, so the European Ryder Cup team is made up of the top three players from the European points list. The top three players from the or three players from the world points list, and then the six additional captains picks. Of course, Rory McIlroy, which is hilarious. He was first in European points, and then Rom and Robert McIntyre, Bobby Mack. I was uh, gonna say that's a dude that a lot of people like. I was pretty shocked to see that he earned his way on via points. Um, he is a, a true DP World Tour guy. Like he plays the full schedule. He plays a shitload. And he is a baller. I just did not really anticipate. He's not that kind of like big name dude, but he's got stones. Like I think yeah, the coming shot, down the stretch. Even though he lost the Scottish Open, there's nothing he could do because he was already in the clubhouse. He, yeah. The shots he made at the Scottish Open on a world stage where everybody's watching that event because yeah. of the Open Championships coming up, I think he proved himself there. Uh, according to Data Golf, of course, this is, you know, Data Golf is one of the more close official world golf rankings. It's something that they take into account all players. Uh, Team Europe is is slated. The first 11 guys are 1 through 53. Uh, Hoygaard, Lowry, and Straka are 51, 52, 53. And then Robert McIntyre's down at almost 130 in wow. the data golf ranks. See, that's so. what I'm saying. Like, And I will say, though, that uh, world ranking points and that they really do kind of suck for the DP World Tour. And maybe with this whole merger deal, you know, DP World Tour kind of got left, it, not left in the dust, but kind of not really talked about because the PGA Tour Live deal was so big. But the DP World Tour is going to get uh, kind of harangued in on this also. And that's going to hopefully improve the um, the world ranking points for the DP World Tour because I think you could win like five times on the DP world tour or three, at least three times. And it's the equivalent to winning like one time for world ranking points purposes on the PGA tour. Like they carry so much less, less weight on the, on the DP world tour that I, I think that something needs to change there because it's a very, very good tour. Like it's not quite the PGA tour, but it's like the second best tour in the world. Yeah. Um, so rounding out the European team, of course we said Rory, John Rahm, Robert McIntyre, Victor Hovland, the hottest golfer on the planet right now. Tyrrell Hatton, one of the most fun. Matt Fitzpatrick, great dude. Uh, Tommy Fleetwood, Sepp Straka, Shane Lowry. Uh, maybe the biggest surprise, Justin Rose being picked. Um, huge. Uh, Donald and Rose go back a long ways. So yeah, I think they, there they was some home cooking came up there at the from same Donald. time. Yeah, that's it is kind of crazy though because they're probably about the same age. And the fact that Donald is captaining this team and Rose is playing on the team, like. It's like LeBron when he looked at his coach and his coach is like younger than he is. Like, what the fuck are we doing here? Yeah. But also, it's it's very cool. I I mean, Justin Rose, the the European tour has done this in the past where they've picked, you know, Poulter or guys like that over, uh, you know, guys that are in form because they're truly like glue guys. And if you look down the list, like there is a lot of rookies on the European team. So I think that they that maybe Luke Donald wanted to balance some of that out with more experience. Yeah, that's that's a fair assumption. And I you know, a guy like Adrian Moronk doesn't move the needle. Justin Rose does for most people, but you know, it's just like the JT pick. It all has to play out. And the United States a little trivia time. The United States hasn't won a Ryder Cup on European soil since 1982? 1993. 93, so neither okay. of us were alive. None of us in this room. No, not Kale, not me, not you. No 31 one years ago. here was alive the last time the United States won the Ryder Cup on U.S. soil. Is this the year on they British get it done? Soil. On, on yes, British soil. Correct. Um, yeah, I think it is, man. The, the amount of inexperience they have over on the European side combined with the amount of experience we do have, like they're going to need Hovland, they're going to need Rory, 
that, you know, it's the they're going to need their dogs need, to be dogs. That's yeah. the thing is like us is stacked one to 12. Yeah. Other than maybe Justin Thomas, but, but he's yeah. got that Ryder cup dog in him, him versus McIntyre is going to be like, <laughs> who can fucking break 80. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> oh boy. That's mean. But, uh, I think we can, you know, it, I think we do get it done. Uh, purely off based off of the the European guys' inexperience, and you know, there's there's four or five of those guys in their prime right now on the the DP World Team um, or on the European Tour Team, not the DP World Team. But then there's four guys that are not yet probably in their prime, and then there's probably four guys that are past their prime. So you just never know. But uh, I do like the year or the the U.S. side getting it done this week or this month. Yeah. Excuse me. God. Coming up later in the year, in the later month. Later in the months. Um, the Time's Ryder, just flying. So the Ryder Cup starts here September, late September. I want to say the 29th. Um, it's going to be on a lot of USA Today sports. It looks like uh, I can't wait because and it's going to be great too because it's going to be morning viewing. It's going to be like morning oh. viewing golf is the best. Uh, having a you know a young kid, oh, it's my favorite. But talk about Sunday scary. Sunday at the Ryder Cup, and then it ends, and then we got no really good golf until fucking. We got football though. Well, yeah, no, we nah, do have football. That doesn't hurt. That Sunday oh, yeah, night football. Never mind. The rubs. Sunday scaries don't exist. Yeah, Sunday scaries season. don't exist from uh, basically early September through or mid January. I wasn't thinking. Yeah, that's that's all right. We all where football's back. We all forget about it. Um, we do want to talk real quick about. We got one more clip, uh, Kale, to pull up real quick from this week. One of the craziest things that's happened in the golf world in a while, um, a driver gets broken on the way to a playoff hole. On the ladies' European tour. On the ladies' European tour, and she ends up losing to the an playoff eagle. to an eagle because she couldn't hit driver. And here's a video of it. Once again, got to check us out on the YouTube. Watch our pod. Lifting up the thing and <laughs> snap. snap. Bag down. And I, I, love, I love the I, look. The look of at each other. She like picks up the driver. She goes, "Oh, that's not just the head cover. That is the Call head. on the radio. Get on the radio." Well, so and I don't. Did you know this? That that was her backup driver. Her first driver broke in transit on the way to the golf tournament. So everybody was like, "Well, get a replacement." You know why don't they have this that? And I don't even. I'm not gonna act like I know the fucking rules. I think she could have gotten a new driver if possible. But for that to be her second driver that gets broken that week. That is like the worst luck possible. Yeah, poor Ann Van Dam. Um, Ann Van Goddamn. <laughs> Ann Van Goddamn, another driver. <laughs> well, and she, I mean, the sad part is, is if I was her, she wasn't really thinking about it, but you get out of that fucking car and you lift that rope. You don't just, you know, she lifted it over her and her driving companion over there, but then you gotta. That wasn't her though. No, was it? Yes, it was. Oh, that was okay. her lifting she broke up the her rope. Own driver. Okay, yeah. I don't feel as bad now. I thought well, that no, she but wasn't. It sucks for her. I mean, not to, and, but it, in the moment you're thinking about the playoff, you're not thinking about, you know, protect my clubs and who, it's just a bad, bad fucking luck on her part. So I do feel very, very bad for her, but, uh, at least she lost to an Eagle, like driver, no driver is a par five. You're not guaranteed, you know, Eagle's a good score to lose to. It's not like she lost cause she made bogey and the other player made par. That's very true. That's very true. So shout out Ann Van Dam. Uh, she's probably winning the women's pip. Um, just based off this week alone, I think that was one of the most viewed, just insane stories in general. Yeah. Um, all right. Before we wrap up, maybe our, I'm going to get a little sad. Don't. Uh, one of our last episodes. We're still going to do a fairway or four over, you know, over. Well, here. yeah, but I mean, this is our last one, like sitting next to each other. I'll be back at um, Christmas. We're going to do a fairway or four. So Mitchell, why don't you start us out with your fairway or four this week? All right. So. This is another food-related topic, no surprise. Most of mine are either about food or alcohol. Uh, but one thing that I've felt pretty strongly about for a while, and, you know, it's like kind of reinventing the wheel uh, nowadays with all these places like Raising Cane's and like Slim Chickens and all this. Slim Chickens. Uh, Slim Chicken's a great name. Uh, also, the logo is like a rooster with like a bandana on, like he's a little bandit. I kind of fuck with that. Gas. Uh but I don't think chicken tenders are that good. I think chicken tenders are overrated. Um, and <laughs> that, I think that they're, it's just chicken. Like, I, and don't get me wrong, like, it is very good. But I think people build up, like, they're like, oh, my God, this is such a good chicken tender. Like, what makes a chicken tender 
that you get from, you know, your fucking 7-Eleven worse than the $4 chicken tender you get from Raisin Cane's. And, you know, all these, like, niche new, like, chicken places. I just, I'm not in on, like, the fad of thinking that chicken tenders are, like, somehow reinvented to, like, this amazing culinary, like, breakthrough. Yeah, they're not anything special. I will say, like, some, for what they, a chicken tender is, like, Raisin Cane's does it really fucking well. Yeah. And there's other places. But at the end of the day, it's a fucking chicken tender. All right, we always get the producer in on this. Kale, give us your chicken tendy take. (laughs) Yo, I love a chicken tender. I, I love them, too, but I think that when people are, like, and I hate to say it, but it's a lot of times it's females. You go to a restaurant, they order chicken tenders. You're like, what are we doing here? There's every you can you can eat chicken tenders at home. You can eat them anywhere, and they're good. But it's like they're not elite. Like it takes no. Well, my, okay. my only pushback on this is your mention of raising canes in this because <laughs> raising canes chicken tenders are elite. Okay. Yep. I I do tend to agree with him there. I would never go to like like I. You have to miss me with any, like, Wendy's chicken tender. You know, any other place that has chicken tenders now, like, once you go to a Raisin Cane's, or I've never been to Slim Chicken, so I can't say for sure. But once you go to a Raisin Cane's, like, it makes every other chicken tender fairly obsolete. We have some really good ones at the DNVR bar that are actually hand-breaded, so yeah. nothing's worse than when you have a piece of chicken tender and it's just, like, three-fourths bread, bread and yeah. then a little chicken. Well, I think that's the big miss on a lot of chicken tenders. I would agree, but here's my thing. Like, chicken tenders are like a Dodge Neon. You can throw fucking a body kit on it. You can throw rims on it. You can soup it up to, you know, you can, it can have 500 horsepower, whatever. It's still a Dodge Neon. You know, it's not caviar. It's not a filet mignon. It's, it's chicken. So like for what it is, it's very good. And I like chicken tenders, but acting like they're at the top of the, the food pyramid is just out of pocket to me. Like, I feel like they, I feel like chicken tenders get overblown, like, you go to a fucking Raisin Cane's, they literally only make chicken tenders. Like, that is, it is crazy. what an entire we t- restaurant's based We on. talked about going there yesterday uh, through the drive through and I was like, do they have chicken sandwiches here? Because I don't necessarily want tenders. I always order, like, the kids' tenders because there's only like, two of them, and I get <laughs> well, a Well, they do make a Coke. sandwich. Guess what? It's just the tenders in between buns. <laughs> like, it's just the exact... And it's a great business idea because they're packed all the fucking time. But I just think that, like... They're very versatile, and that's what makes them good because kids, everybody eats them no matter what the age. I just, I think, like, when people are like, oh, my favorite thing is chicken tenders. I'm like, you've really never tried anything better than a fucking, that just shows me that, like, you're a gutter palate. Like, if that's your, you go to a nice restaurant, you order chicken tenders, that's what I'm out on. So however you want to word that, um, chicken tenders are overrated. I feel like that's probably going to get the most interaction. But you really do have to listen to what I'm saying on the pod. To, <laughs> you have to listen to me. Yeah, you have to hear what I'm saying to to understand what I'm saying. <laughs> yes, <laughs> Is, am I, I fucking understand. John Madden. Um, but yeah, that's that's just I, I have a bone to pick with everyone who's like, oh, chicken tenders are the best thing ever. Like these chicken tenders are good chicken tenders, no problem. These chicken <laughs> yeah. tenders are the best food in the world. That's what I have a problem with. Gotcha. That's a fair stum- assumption. All right. So since you're piggybacking on your normal food takes, <laughs> I'm gonna go into my back to my bathroom takes. Oh. Um. And this isn't a fair way or four of like a. It's not really a hot take. It's just more is of this a. Gonna be a shot at me. because no. you Share a bathroom. No. 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 Oh, this okay. is like a. Do you do this or do you not? All right. So picture yourself. You go into a big bathroom. Okay. At a, not a sporting event because they're usually full. It's not realistic. Into an office building, and you're in the stall alone. Nobody's in the bathroom. Okay, how many how many stalls? How many urinals? Uh, the only stall. Okay, but well, well there's, there's not three, three stalls. So, three so you're urinals, like one, one stall. One stall, one urinal. Yeah, just like a smaller Standard, bathroom. Like yeah, not a business holder. center. Okay, you're you're walking me back. Okay, you <laughs> go into your re- your regular restaurant bathroom. There's okay. one shitter. Okay, one urinal or okay. two urinals doesn't matter. Okay, you're in there alone. Somebody comes in. Do okay. you make noise in order for them to know you're there? Um, I 100% do every single time. I, yeah. ca- I hit him with a cough, hit him with a something. Yeah. Hey, I'm in here. I had a dude bust in one time. I, I think everybody's been there at one point or another where you forget to lock it. And somebody just barges the fuck in on you. And the guy's like, oh, I'm so sorry. And just like, dude, I had a guy do that to me in Austin. We we're at a bachelor party. We were at that bar, unbar leaveable. Oh, okay. I had to go. I had to go. <laughs> and I'm in the bat. I'm in the stall. And it's like one of two stalls. But then this group of like 20, I, I went in there and it was empty. And I just like get that immediate relief when that happens. 
And I go in there and it's 20 dudes, like a whole group of dudes came in, probably some from some other bar. The first thing they got to do is piss, you know, and then you reset your, you go back to the bar after that. So like 20 dudes come in, it's so loud. I couldn't necessarily get it to lock all the way. So I'm panicking. This you, you, drunk you, dude barges in, dude, and just goes, hey. And I'm like, <laughs> that's where you, oh, like, I'm like, that's hey, where man. you sit on the crapper and you got dude, like one arm. Uh, like I holding. couldn't reach. No, it was a big stall. Oh, couldn't reach. Okay. Okay. Couldn't reach. Otherwise, oh, I would have had. And you're just like sitting in the corner yeah. with your shorts around your ankles, <laughs> like, oh, please don't come in here. Yeah. Like, yeah. <laughs> he just barged right in and he goes, hey. And I go, what's up, dude? <laughs> And I just finished. Luckily, it's not, like, if you're at that bar, you're shit-faced, so no, he's he not He didn't remember, remember yeah, that Yeah, he had no idea. But then I had to walk out, and there's all these dudes waiting in line to go to the t- stalls, and they're just all chilling, and they shit. And then they locked the door because their buddies <laughs> trying to get in, and they locked him out. I was, it was a fucking, I was having a panic attack. I, I, need, right. I need to throw one more thing out about, or are we getting Kale's? We got to get Kale's opinion. Yes. Do you make noise? So, like... I'm a coffer. I'll like throw okay, yeah. like a cough out. Yeah. Just like a <coughs> yeah, you know? exactly. Like, hey, I'm here. If my farts aren't loud enough to in, let you know I'm here. Like, occupado. I'm here. <laughs> it's just somebody barges in on you. You're just like occupied. Like, fuck I might, me. I might start doing that. Um, but one thing I gotta throw out there about toilets because I think it's like the funniest thing ever, and it's just like universally like an untalked about thing amongst dudes is airport bathrooms. Dudes just let it fly in there. Oh, like, they're, the, they're the, the loudest bathrooms yes, in history. Those are the, like, ever, there's going to be somebody in there at all times. <laughs> like, there's no sense in trying to take a quiet shit in an airport bathroom. Like, you've just got <laughs> half a dozen dudes all fucking wrecking the toilet. <laughs> It's it, there's just no and nobody bats an eye like I'm staying at the <laughs> most lawless place on the planet. Yes, it's just savage. Like I'm standing at the urinal taking a piss and somebody's just <laughs> unloading it, but like ten feet behind me and I laugh out loud. But nobody gives it. Like you got to go. You got yeah. you know you're getting on an airplane. What's better that you know you're you're running out of choices. Yeah. So it just fucking cracks me up every time you walk into an airport bathroom and it's just the audio in there is fucking. <laughs> Sounds like a packed stadium just through the roof. I love that shit. Oh, that's so good. All right. Well, that's going to wrap up this pod. Kale, thanks for producing for us, man. This might be this might be the last one until Christmas break of us in the studio together. So enjoy what you're seeing. Make sure you're following us on YouTube. Like and subscribe. Give us a thumbs up on this episode if you enjoyed it. YouTube, uh, Big Drive Energy. X, Big Drive Energy. Like that. Nobody's calling it X. I'm calling it fucking Well, X. they're saying X, but still calling it tweets. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I'm doing a tweet. There's a lot of things that are just messed up about it. I'm calling it X. Follow us on the X at Big Drive Energy. Instagram at Big Drive Energy Pod. TikTok, Big Drive Energy. Uh, is that enough Big Drive Energies for you? Not yet, because I am at Big Drive Spence. He is at Big Drive Mitch. We appreciate you all tuning in for one of the last times in studio together. Peace. <laughs> Don't do